This uh, session is all about education and identity in Canada and Mexico, and we've got four speakers. Um, I will introduce all four, and then we will just proceed through the four papers, and then once everyone has presented, we will open up um, the time for questions and, and discussion. So our first speaker is Conrad Stace, and he is the archivist as he's the second from the end, he's the middle there. He's the archivist at the Mennonite Heritage Archives here in Winnipeg, where he manages the archival collection as well as helps researchers. Uh, he is also the co-editor of the magazine or the archives magazine, Mennonite Historian. And his research, when he has time for it, <laughs> um, includes Mennonites in Manitoba, conscientious objectors, and midwives. He will be presenting a paper called, Was It Really About Education? The Zummerfelder Burke Tyler split of 1893 reconsidered. Our next speaker is Roger Taves, who will be presenting his paper remotely. Um, Roger is a high school principal in Menno Colony in Paraguay, and he holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Canadian Mennonite University. And his paper, The Mennonite School Peti Petitions from 1916 to 1921 looks at the changing shape of Mennonite education in Paraguay. The third paper is Abe Wall, who is the one at the far end. Um, Abe is a first generation immigrant to Canada from Nuevo Ideal Durango in Mexico. He has a master's of education degree from Western University in London. And his educational career has focused on advocating for equity and inclusivity in public education for, low German Mennonite, for the low German Mennonite community in Southwestern Ontario. And for the past five years, he has been, looking, he has been working as the uh, Tu Puente Regional Program Director, which we will hear about more in his paper. And then the fourth presenter is Emma Huybens, who is um, working on a PhD on the Salamanca, Quintana Roo Mennonite community in of Old Colony Mennonites in Mexico. Um, and she will be presenting on School and Autonomy, Village Schools in the Old Colony Community of Salamanca, Kitana Roo, Mexico. Sorry for my poor Dutch and Spanish pronunciation. <laughs> but we will start with Conrad. And so, yeah. How do I use the remote for the slides? The green? Okay. This presentation is about the formation of the Zummerfeld Mennonite Church in Manitoba, which became one of the groups that had some members moved south in the 1920s. The migration of Mennonites to Manitoba in the 1870s consisted of three main groups, the Rhinelander, Kleinegemeinde, and the Mennonites from the Birchtal colony. Within a few years, fracturing within these groups occurred. For the Mennonites from Birchtal, this included the creation of the Zummerfeld and Birchtaler denominations in 1893. 1893 is the year that Abram Dirksen was elected as bishop of the Zummerfeld church, and then he was ordained in 1894. This division has often been characterized as a dispute over higher education caused by the establishment of the Mennonite Collegiate Institute, or MCI, in Gretna. In the crudest form of this narrative, the issue has been characterized as the smaller group, the Burschtaler, who wanted education, and the three-quarters larger group who did not, the Zummerfeld Mennonites. Debates over the appropriate kind or amount of education has been a long-standing issue dating back to the 1860s in the Burschtal colony, Russia. While education issues were important, were there other factors at play? And this paper talks about some of these other factors. In 1905, the Med Educational Institute, or MEI, a rival school to the MCI, was established seven miles north in Altona. By 1916, the Zummerfeld Mennonite Church officially allowed its members to support the Gretna and Altona schools of higher education. By 1922, Peter A. Taves was on the Altona School Board. By 29, he was ordained minister and in 1930, bishop of the Zummerfeld Mennonite Church. 
Historian Henry Gerbrand states that by 1926, the whole board of directors of the Altona School were members of the Zimmerfeld Mennonite Church. Did the Zimmerfeld Mennonites do an about face in two decades, accepting schools of higher education? Or were there other factors at play that caused the split? This paper suggests that Heinrich H. Ewert, in his role as principal of the MCI in Gretna, became a lightning rod and was an important factor in the split. He was seen to represent government meddling, American evangelical forces, and was personally unimpressed with the more tradition-minded Mennonites that formed the larger Zummerfeld Mennonite Church. Mennonites from the Birchtel colony of Russia moved to land in Manitoba set aside for Mennonite settlement east of the Red River starting in 1874. And by 1878, it was registered as the Mennonite Church of Kortitz and became known as Kortitzer. Because of poor crops, uh, due to early frosts and wet conditions, two-thirds of the Kortitzer Church moved to the more open plains of the Mennonite West Reserve between 1878 and 1881. The established villages on the eastern half of the West Reserve represented in the green on the map. Leaders from the East Reserve served the transplanted Kortitzer communities. In 1882, Kortitzer Bishop David Stace ordained Johann Funk from the village of Alberstal to serve the Kortitzers on the West Reserve. These core teachers on the West Reserve offered an alternative to the Rhinelander Church on the western half of the West Reserve. In 1880, Rhinelander Bishop Johann Wiebe called for a recommitment to the church. While most remained with the Rhinelander Church, several families opted to join the newly arrived core teachers and help build church centers in Edinburgh in 1883 and by 1887 in Rudnevida, Hoffnungsfeld, and Rhineland. In addition to some Rhinelanders, there were families from the Malachta and Borzenko colonies in Russia who were part of this early Kortitzer church on the West Reserve. So this mix of backgrounds made it hard to maintain a unified outlook on church matters. Bishop Funk set a vision for the church that included improvements in education, becoming involved in foreign missions, and making a policy that allowed ministers from other denominations to preach in the church known as pulpit exchange. Funk was convinced that new life and new forms needed to be introduced to the community and welcomed greater accommodation to the larger society. In 1885, Funk proposed a teacher's training school to improve education in the Mennonite village schools, but it did, it did not receive enough support within the church. But three years later, in 1888, a teacher's training school, Mennonite Collegiate Institute, became a reality through a separate school society outside of the church Funk's support for the school and other changes placed his leadership in doubt already in 1892. The Manitoba provincial government had been looking for ways to influence the education in Mennonite village schools. He approached the MCI and offered to help pay the salary of a competent teacher who would not only instruct Mennonite teachers but serve as the inspector of Mennonite schools for the government. Heinrich H. Hewitt of Halstead, Kansas was brought to Manitoba to consider the job. Ewart met with the school society, as well as provincial minister Clifford Sifton, who assured Ewart that the government did not want to limit the freedoms of the Mennonites, only to improve the level of education. In 1891, Ewart accepted the job, and he moved to Gretna. The linkage with the government increased concern among many Mennonites. Some argued that accepting money from the government for schools was a thin edge of the wedge, and here is proof of greater government involvement reducing the autonomy Mennonites were promised in running their own schools. Ewer took on the challenge and sought as part of his mission not only to change what was taught, but also increase the number of village schools accepting government funding and greater government influences. For some Mennonites, they began to see a pattern of erosion of autonomy, accepting government money for village schools, reduction in civic autonomy with the 1880 Municipality Act, and now in 1891 with hiring a school inspector and teacher, H. H. Ewart. Ewart was on the government payroll, and he was also tied to American evangelical forays into the Mennonite communities. The Mennonites moving to Manitoba in the 1870s had lived in the Russian state that kept groups separate to reduce conflict. Lutherans, Catholics, and Mennonites were settled in their own colonies, and the gov Russian government's guardianship committee oversaw the various colonies. Proselytizing was frowned upon and even illegal when it came to trying to convert members of the Russian Orthodox faith. 
These expectations and laws were not in place in Manitoba. While the Mennonite leadership came to Manitoba to largely remain separate from the larger society, the world came knocking. As early as 1879, missionaries from the U.S. were circulating in the Mennonite communities, sowing dissatisfaction and creating new communities. Between 1879 and 1899, no fewer than six American denominations sent 15 missionaries to visit the Mennonites of southern Manitoba. This is in addition to the Catholic, Lutheran, and Anglican churches being established in some of the economic centers like Gretna, Winkler, Altona, Rosenfeld, and Cooley. John Haldeman came to southern Manitoba from Ohio in 1879 and was successful in winning converts, including half the Kalina Gemeinde and Bishop Peter Taves. Mennonite Brethren from Mountain Lake, Minnesota sent Heinrich Voth and David Dick numerous times between 1884 and the formal organization of a church near Winkler, Manitoba in 1888. Swedenborgians, Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists all became active in the mid to late 1880s. But the group who sent the most American evangelists to the Mennonites southern Manitoba was the General Conference Mennonites. John B. Baer came in 1887, 89, and 90, 91, 95, and 99. Heinrich Reichert in 1889 and 1890. Andreas Mack, Isaac Peters, J.J. Balser, N.F. Taves, H.H. H. Regeer. All these guys were active in southern Manitoba between 1889 and 1894. The message and methods were foreign to most Mennonites in Manitoba. N.F. Taves was stationed by the General Conference Home Mission Board in Gretna from 1891 to 1894. Taves claimed that the battle for Gretna and the Mennonite people was on. He feared other denominations would woo the Mennonites to, into other denominations. Taves was an enthusiastic speaker and placed much emphasis on radical conversion experiences and traveled across the Mennonite West Reserve. So here's a chart showing some of the missionaries and dates they were active in Manitoba. The kinship networks of the Mennonites uh, and the practicing of visiting on Sunday afternoons helped spread the idea of evangelists, even between East and West Reserves. The evangelists were usually greeted and welcomed into the communities hosted by the Mennonite ministers and bishops and allowed, at times, to speak on Sunday mornings. Some families came under pressure from more than one evangelist and changed commu communities more than once. David Nickel settled on the West Reserve as part of the Rhinelander Church. Later, he becomes part of the Johann Funk Group. Then, 1887, he joins the Midnight Brethren. Then, he and his family were among the first converts to the Seventh day Adventists in 1893. Nickel and his family had promised allegiance to four communities in less than two decades. These changing allegiances were not like changing grocery stores or fitness clubs. The changing of faith communities would have involved a lot of decision and soul searching. Sorry, a lot of discussion and soul searching. These were discussions of deep importance that sometimes meant not only changing communities, but making public declarations of the inadequacy of the old community symbolized in rebaptism. Jacob and Anna Bannman were members of the Rhinelander Church, but followed the advice of Mennonite Brethren missionary Heinrich Voth and were rebaptized in 1886 in the Dead Horse Creek, north of Winkler. The Bannmans were concerned that physical violence would break out at the baptism instigated by the Bannman family. Inspector Ewart had a close relationship with some of these general conference evangelists who were in Manitoba. He was close friends with H.P. Reichert. Ewart was the brother-in-law to evangelist John B. Baer. Not only did Ewart have a close connection to the general conference, he himself was the organizer of the General Conference of Mennonites in Canada, according to the Global Anabaptist Mennonite Encyclopedia Online. In the history of the Mennonite General Conference, Ewart is claimed as one of their own. Quote, Ewart, being in full sympathy with the conference movement, opened a school in Gretna and conducts it with gratifying success. He is able to supply many local schools with teachers from his normal school, inasmuch as these young teachers are more advanced in knowledge and hold to a higher standard of spiritual life Improved conditions are gradually permeating the whole settlement through his work. Ewart also frequently preaches and in, on, and in this manner exerts directly an influence for good upon the community." End quote. Ewart was looked on with suspicion because he was on the government's payroll 
for his support and close ties to General Conference missionaries from the U.S., and for his personal history and views. Ewart had a different background than the Russian Mennonites in Manitoba. Ewart was born in 1855 in Prussia and immigrated to Hillsborough, Kansas in 1874. He was educated at Des Moines Institute in Iowa and took a two-year theology course in Martin, Marthasville, Missouri. He taught for a few years in his home district until 1882, and he became teacher and principal of a Mennonite parochial school in Alexanderville, Kansas. The school was transferred to Halstead, Kansas, and became known as the Mennonite Seminary, where he taught from 1883 to 1891. Yurt was seen as an outsider, someone from the United States. Mennonites who immigrated to Manitoba deliberately chose not to settle in the U.S. and believed that American Mennonites compromised their faith because U.S. government would not guarantee them military exemption and the ability to run their own schools. Manitoba Mennonites did not take kindly to American Mennonites teaching them a better way. Already by 1892, Ewart reports opposition to the school is growing. Ewart believed the Mennonites were of a rough caliber. He said they were stubborn and very mistrusting. He was hopeful that eventually they would submit to being worked on and molded. Accepting the call to Manitoba was a difficult decision, and he was aware there would be opposition. At one point in his life, Ewart wanted to be a missionary, but he later stated that, quote, the Mennonites in Manitoba were in much need of help as the heathen of Africa, and that without education, the Mennonites would falter. In conclusion, while education is part of the reason for the church split that created the Zomerfeld and Birchtaler denominations, the situation was more complicated. Johann Funk and the Birchtalers were more open to incorporating new ideas, including those from eva American evangelists. The Zummerfeld group was more wary of the American influences, some of which centered around teacher and inspector Heinrich H. Ewart. Ewart's ties to the provincial government, evangelizing American missionaries, and his own negative views about Mennonites in Manitoba were also significant factors. Outside the Mennonite Heritage Archives, where I work, is a six-sided monument to commemorate Mennonite educators. In 1983, the first person honored on this monument was Heinrich H. Ewart. The plaque outlines his many activities and services to the Mennonite community. The last line on the plaque reads, quote, Ewart was a bridge builder between the Mennonite community and the larger Canadian society. Building bridges to the Canadian or American societies is exactly what the more tradition-minded Mennonites were guarding against. Thank you. Our next speaker will be on, uh, on Zoom, I think. So once that gets once that gets set up, we'll, we'll go. Testing, testing. I think that's me there. Well, first I would, I would like to thank the organizers of this event, especially Ben, 
for the opportunity to share this, this brief presentation here. This presentation will actually focus on the school petitions from Manitoba Mennonites from 1960 to 1921 and not current school dynamics um, in Monotolony, Paraguay, as announced in the presentation. Now, now this small inaccuracy is, is absolutely on my account. Uh, you should have seen the confusing bio I sent in. Let's do to that. Uh, secondly, I would have absolutely preferred to attend this conference in person to connect uh, personally with, with the attendants, some of whom I know from before, and, and others I would, I would like to get to know. Uh, and thirdly, I would like to apologize in advance for some grammar and sentence structure related speed bumps in my presentation. Uh, had my great grandparents not decided to leave Canada, my English probably would be way better today. So now let's dive into the Mennonite school petitions from 1916 to 1921. Uh, Mennonite settlers in Manitoba resisting the Compulsory School Attendance Act. And I will just try to share this uh, presentation I have here. Just a second. Oh, come on. All right, the census of the Prairie provinces of 1916 revealed that 42% of Manitoba population consisted of 38 different nationalities. In light of this cultural diversity, the goal of the Manitoba Compulsory School Attendance Act of the same year was quite remarkable. In the words of Robert S. Thornton, then Secretary of Education in Manitoba, the School Attendance Act would contribute in making the people, quote, Manitobans and Canadians, not French or Mennonites, not Poles or Polish Jews, end of quote. The Mennonites were one cultural group affected by the Compulsory School Attendance Act. For them, the German language was a central cultural and religious value. Immediately after they took notice about the newly established law, they handed in written applications to government officials in which they asked for permission to continue with their traditional system of education. These documents, also known as school petitions, were written from 1916 to 1921. On the one hand, they provide insights into the values, beliefs, and convictions of the early 20th century Manitoba Mennonites. On the other hand, these petitions record at least to, uh, to a little extent, the process of decision-making of Mennonites to leave Canada. In this short presentation, I will therefore brief briefly touch upon the content of each Mennonite school petition. The values of these Mennonites stood in direct contradiction to the Manitoba government's effort to convert a multicultural province into an English-speaking community. A coexistence of such entirely different educational philosophies was impossible and neither side was willing to cede from their position. Now, what was the Compulsory School Attendance Act of 1916 about? It established English as the only language of instruction and therefore overruled the Manitoba School Act of 1819 that had allowed bilingual instructions in schools. Furthermore, the School Attendance Act made it mandatory for all children in Manitoba to attend schools, whether public or private, that taught according to the curriculum established by the Ministry of Education in Manitoba. Most Mennonite schools did fulfill neither of these requirements. They taught only in German and were still following the centuries old school system from Prussia, teaching on four levels, feeble, which translates roughly into reading learning book, then catechism, New Testament and Bible. A key aspect to keep in mind when speaking about the school question in, in, in Mennonite villages in early 20th century Manitoba is the so-called privilegium. Historically speaking, Mennonites had always had a kind relationship with privilegium um, wherever they settled. A privilegium is a letter from a government official, preferably a monarch themselves that promises them exemptions from different civic duties such as military service, public schooling systems, or even exemptions from certain taxes. 
The Russian Mennonite delegates that visited Manitoba in 1870 asked the Dominion government for a privilegium, which they got. Um, basically in form of a letter that, that summarized the immigration laws already existing at that point in time. Point 10 of this letter, though, stated that, quote, the fullest privileges of exercising their religious principles is by law afforded to the Mennonites without any kind of molestation or restriction, whatever. And the same privilege extends to the education of their children in school. Later on, and after a discussion between Dominion government official and representatives of the British Crown, the phrase, as provided by the law, was added to this point. Now, the Mennonite delegates were not aware of this change since they had already left. But this additional phrase subordinated this privilegium to the School Attendance Act in 1916, at least in legal terms. Now, before going into, into the, the, the petitions themselves, I'd like to make a brief overview of the somewhat confusing arrangement of Mennonite congregations in Manitoba at the time. There were five Mennonite congregations, two on the East Reserve, uh, which were the Kartitsa Church and the Kleine Gemeinde. Uh, and on the West Reserve, we had three churches, the Rhineland Church and the Sommerfelder. And these four churches were basically against the School Attendance Act of 1916. The only church, to some extent, cooperating with the School Attendance Act of 1916 was the Bergthaler Church which reformed the church in 1819, uh, a, a topic that, that uh, my colleague um, Conrad just discussed. Now, when looking at the, at, the, at the dates when the school petitions were sent in, we see that the first two petitions were sent in in 1916. The first one from the Bergthaler and Sommerfeld Church, and then the second one from all, well, from all churches but one. Just the Rhineland Church did not did not sound uh, participate in the second uh, school petition. Then, in 1919, three years later, uh, the Rhineland Church sent in a second school petition, and then uh, another one followed in October from Bergthal and Kleine Gemeinde, um, and another one from Kleine Gemeinde and Kartitza Church, and then two petitions more in 1920. And now I will go into each one of those school petitions. The first school petition was handed in on, on January 7 of 1916. It was in a meeting between representatives of the Bergthaler and Sommerfelder churches of the West Reserve and Minister of Agriculture, Valentine Winkler. This meeting took place in Rosenfeld, a Mennonite village, and before the School Attendance Act was passed. The petitioners asked, among others, for the School Act of 1890 to stay in effect. This later, latter also mentioned the privilegium, calling it, quote, a written declaration of the Dominion government, end of quote, that promised the Mennonites to run their own schools. This petition led to a meeting between leaders of Mennonite communi communities and government officials, which took place on February uh, 15 of 1916. The Mennonites were represented by the bishops and preachers of all Mennonite congregations of Manitoba, except the Rhineland Church or Old Colony Church. The Manitoba government was represented by Prime Minister Norris, Minister of Education Thornton, Minister Winklers, and others. The written petition, which the Mennonite representatives handed in on this meeting, emphasized the right to run, run their own schools granted in the Privilegium of 1870 and mentioned the possibility to leave Canada if this right would be taken away. On this occasion, the Mennonites were promised the right to continue their school system, but public schools would have to work according to the School Attendance Act. Consequently, several Mennonite public schools were reverted to private schools. However, in fall of 1918, after the end of the Great War, Minister of Education Thornton started to implement the School Attendance Act of 1916, also in the Mennonite villages. This meant that public schools were built in Mennonite villages and the Mennonite settlers were prompted to send their children to those schools. These Mennonite settlers called them Zwangsschulen. Many Mennonite farmers resisted and paid fines. Some even spent some time in jail because of not sending their children to public schools. The third school petition act was then handed in on February the 3rd, 1919, by the Rhinelander Church. This petition asked for an unbiased investigation of the moral condition in their community in order to see 
if their school system needed a change. It also mentioned the privilegium of 1870 in several occasions. This petition was declined, upon which the old colony sent delegates to Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay in 1919. In 1922, uh, the old colony Mennonites, or at least as I understand most of them, migrated to Mexico. In October of 1919, the Bergthaler Church of West Reserve and Kleine Gemeinde sent the fourth petition, this one to the Dominion government in Ottawa, reminding the government of their promised May in the Privilegium in 1870 regarding their own schools. The Dominion government answered by stating that school-related issues were handled by provincial governments and therefore the government in Ottawa could not do anything on this matter. In the same month, the bishops and one preacher of the Kartitzer Church and the Kleine Gemeinde, in total four representatives, met with uh, Manitoba government officials, including Minister of Education Thornton and Minister of Agriculture Winkler, handing in a fifth school petition. This meeting did not start off on the right foot, since none of the Mennonite representatives were able to speak English. Instead, they asked Minister Winkler to translate for them. The letter they handed in emphasized that the Mennonites were invited to settle in Manitoba, that the privilegium granted them freedom in their education system, and that they were, they were honest and loyal residents. Dr. Thornton answered in written form, stating that the Canadian flag defended Mennonite rights in the Great War in Europe, and that the Mennonites should therefore be thankful to accept public schools in their villages, and that the Mennonites Mennonite children would be given the chance to learn English. The Mennonite leaders concluded from this meeting that some sort of a compromise in the school question had become inevitable for them, a perception that was perceived clearly in the following school petition. In January 1920, two representatives of the Carty Thatcher stated in the sixth school petition, and this time to a letter to Dr. Thornton, that they now fully understood the goals of the Department of Education and that the congregation was willing to adapt their schools to the provincial standards. What the Cartitza representatives asked for was time for a gradual pro process or transition in which the schools would adapt to provincial standards. The main reason for this request was the fact that most of the teachers in these Mennonite schools were not qualified to teach in provincial schools and that they would get the necessary training in this period of time. Dr. Torrington declined this proposal on February 17 of 1920, stating that it would be an advantage for the Mennonite children to have teachers from outside of their community. The consequence was a seventh school petition in October of 1920. A total of 21 representatives of the Cartitzer and Sommerfeld Church announced that the School Attendance Act of 1916 lifted or annulled the Mennonites' right to handle their school issues granted in the Privilegium of 1870. Therefore, they were now forced to leave Canada. They asked for a 10 years time period in which they, could, they would be allowed to prepare and carry out the emigration without any government intervention. There was no official response to this letter from the gov Manitoba government. In February of 1921, these Mennonite congregations sent a group of delegates to Paraguay. The provincial government of Manitoba did not consider it to be likely that the Mennonites would leave their farms in large numbers, as a memo from J.F. Greenway, official school trustee of Mennonite schools, to Dr. Thornton Schultz. Greenway's concluded that, quote, the percentage of Mennonite people who may leave this province was very small, small, end of quote. The Cartitzer and Sommerfelder churches sent a last memo to the Manitoba government in March of 1921. In this document, the petitioners outlined the settlement history of Mennonites in Manitoba, emphasized the fact that the government of MacDonald had invited them to settle in Canada back in 1870, that the Privilegium promised them to run their own schools, and that therefore the Manitoba government had a moral although not legal obligation to keep their promises. Again, the signers assured their willingness to leave Canada if the Manitoba government would not, quote, stop persecuting, end of quote, them. However, the education department 
saw no reason to make any compromises since the implementation of public schools was considered to be a success. In September of 1921, the congregation members of the Kartitzer and Sommerfelder churches voted after they wanted to migrate to Paraguay or to Mexico. Those that voted in favor of Mexico left Manitoba and Saskatchewan in 1922. The migration to Paraguay was delayed until 1926. By then, the number of people willing to migrate to Paraguay had diminished significantly from 448 to 267 families. Still, about 25% of the Mennonite population in Manitoba left the province. Some conclusions in forms of thesis statements. One, the privilegium of 1870 on which the Mennonites based their right to have their own schools was the central argument in all of the school petitions. Two, after the first two school petitions that were handed in in 1916 during the Great War, no further petitions were handed in until the implementation of public schools in Mennonite villages after the war was over in 1918 when the School Attendance Act of 1916 reached the Mennonite villages, so to speak. Three, the Kartitsa Church was represented in all petition letters except the third one, which was handed in by the old colony or Rhineland Church alone. Most of, her, of the Rhinelander left Manitoba for Mexico in 1922. The divisions, four, the divisions be between Mennonite churches in early 20th century Man Manitoba shine through in the school petitions since most of them seem to be going out from one or only two churches. The only exception is the second school petition coming from four of the five Mennonite congregations existing in Manitoba at the time. Number five, although Man and immigration came up quite early as an alternative to school reformation in the second petition in February 1916, it seems as if the Mennonites would have preferred to stay in Manitoba. And number six, the compromise suggested by the Cartier Church supports this assumption, but it came in a little late in January 1920. Now, interestingly enough, and that connects uh, to, the, to the development of the school question in Paraguay, Interestingly enough, the gradual ad adaptation of the Kartitsa church school system to official standard, as suggested in the sixth school petition in January of 1920, was carried out in the Paraguayan Chaco some 30 to 40 years after leaving Canada. Now, this is a topic into which my colleague Patrick Friesen uh, will go a little deeper into tomorrow. Thank you. So good afternoon, as introduced, my name is Abe Wall and I'm an educator from Ontario. I work with the Thames Valley District School Board whose uh, operations operate out of London, Ontario, Canada, for those that aren't familiar with the school district system in Ontario. And I'm the Regional Program Director for Tu Puente. Uh, and again, for those of you that don't speak Spanish, this was named by our students to mean your bridge. And essentially, I've focused my work in this capacity and certainly have in the last, well, the 30 years of my entire career designing programming uh, specifically aimed at engaging learners from our low German Mennonite community. So uh, for those of you that can't read this, uh, myself included, <laughs> I will read this for you because this is a quote I came across when I was doing my own graduate work, and it reads, for the child of my fathers and my generation, school could be and often was a painful place. Everything valued by one's parents, everything that made up one's after school life was feared, misunderstood, occasionally ridiculed, and always subtly undermined. Everything associated with the most significant landmarks of human existence, everything that was most sacred, most poignant, most satisfying, all of that was somehow second or third rate. And as mentioned earlier in, my, in the introduction or in my bio, uh, I am a first generation immigrant uh, from the uh, old colony system in Durango. And again, for those of you that are not familiar with it, it's about the tenth of the size of what it is in Chihuahua, but it was one of the first 
uh, areas to be settled uh, in Mexico. My great-great-grandfather was actually one of the delegates that helped find that land. And when I came across this uh, in my own research, I realized that this could have been just as well written by me and my experience in public education in Ontario. And even more importantly, and with a greater degree of um, consideration, those students that you see in the background, all of our, uh, well, most of them, um, they're all two Puente students, but each one of them, based on their own experience and their own retelling their story about why they're not engaged in public education, could have written that very same uh, quote. So uh, the work that I do with Thames Valley um, really seeks to uh, engage the newcomers in whatever capacity. And I work for Thames Valley, but I also represent six school districts. And all of the feelings that our students have had over their life, and certainly their parents and their own lived experiences, have uh, echoed this sentiment, which is completely contrary to the position that Thames Valley has as the Ministry of Education and certainly the other districts that I work with, where we want to be equitable and inclusive and take into consideration when we build programming and design curriculum that we have learners in our midst that really don't feel a part of our system. And so the work that we do really seeks to um, understand and acknowledge the historic trauma that many of these parents had, either through the migration process or their own experiences in public education, and how can we, as those um, harbingers of power and authority, use what we have to mitigate those kinds of experiences so that our newcomers, our young children, no longer have to experience those very same things. Many of our students uh, migrate back and forth annually for reasons of poverty, uh, as is the case with many of those in southwestern Ontario, which there's about 60,000 uh, low German Mennonite-speaking uh, people in southwestern Ontario. Those that are in the initial stages of that migration process really do follow housing and work. Um, and so they can come to Ontario and work for a few years, uh, or work for a few months a year, and then, then leave, simply because they cannot afford to stay. So five years ago, oh, we started looking at some of the gaps in the learning. And so if you were to talk to any teacher in southwestern Ontario about, tell me about your low German Mennonite students, they would say that they're hardworking, they're intelligent, they're polite, they're industrious, they're committed. Uh, but they would also say that they're disengaged and really see themselves as not part of the classroom. And many of that, or much of that, really can be attributed to them not really living permanently in any one world. And I can't remember the quote, but it was a few presentations ago where, you know, they're not really a part of here and not really a part of there. So many of our students are reluctant to start in the fall because they think, why bother? Because in October or November, when the fields are empty, we're going back to Mexico. When they come back in the spring, the same sentiment is echoed again. Why bother starting? Uh, school's going to be out in a few months, and I'll be out in the fields anyway. So these kinds of sentiments start when they're young, uh, like six, seven, eight years old, which is far too young for any student in any situation or environment to feel themselves disconnected. So five, six years ago, myself and another administrator from Thames Valley took a learning tour of the Durango settlement um, just to look at what could things look like. And so um, this is a school. That, this picture was taken six years ago. So in their school system, and you, many of you that have been to the Heritage Village will recognize that color blue of the seats. That's the same used color that they used, call it Mennonite blue. But anyway, nothing's changed. Uh, those, those work desks still have ink wells. And what was really, uh, it came full circle for me because if I would have stayed or if my family would have stayed, mind you, I left there when I was six and I didn't return there again until 45 years later when I showed up uh, on a cold call to meet with Mr. Wall who's leaning against the post, he's the old colony teacher there when he's not farming, and asked him if I could come visit after an hour and a half of talking while he and his worker uh, finished the bean harvest and he invited me to come in he said but don't come Friday afternoon because that is the day that we do art and uh, I said well you know um, I'm an art teacher I've been trained as such and do so and have done so in Ontario would you mind if I le uh, led a lesson and it was really quite a life experience or a career experience or a career high for me because had I not left that would be the school that I would have attended so it felt a little bit full circle for me in being able to come back uh, or, or go see that place. And I was warned by many in Ontario, you know, the old colony is impenetrable um, in Durango. 
and they won't let you in. And it's going to be very, they'll be resistant to you even doing anything having to do with their kids, regardless of whether or not they engage in the parochial school system when they come in the winter or not. Um, but playing the Mennonite game and speaking Plotich, it didn't take long to open some doors. So uh, this program, and there are many programs across southern Ontario now, and Thames Valley has really made a concerted effort over the last number of years to rethink how we do education. Many would suggest that uh, this is out of the box, and, and, and I'm always quick to respond that no, it's not out of the box. It's completely inside the box. I don't break any rules. We don't extend perimeters. We follow the rules and regulations which we're guided by. I think as educators, though, we've learned really quickly that the box is shaped much differently than we ever allowed ourselves to believe, and it's certainly a lot larger than we've given ourselves credit to explore um, the expanses in there. So we looked at what does the Education Act require in terms of student retention and, and admission and registration in schools, and how does that couple with uh, an Ontario and certainly a district focus on equitable and inclusive education, and, and really did find that there is a lot of depth and breadth uh, that's available for those that are willing, enough, willing and courageous enough to try things differently, to change the narrative for so many of our learners. And so we went through the policy both at the provincial level, at the local level, at the district level. We looked at things like faith-based accommodations, the focus on equity, diversity, and inclusivity, culturally re re responsive and uh, CRRP, culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy, and most importantly, we really developed within the um, senior administration particularly, not only in Thames Valley, but across the province, and with the Ministry of Education, with Patrick Case being the Assistant Deputy Minister uh, in charge of equitable and inclusive education in Ontario, at the table with us thinking, how can we support these students? And that, I can't uh, stress enough um, the need to have that political will in place and, and the want for senior administration to be able to make those things happen again because they are the ones that hold the power and historically the folks that we work with have really taken a back seat and saw themselves maybe humbled themselves too much as Mennonites and say you know we're not worthy we don't want to be a part of this don't go through any extra troubles but we as, as educators wanted to, and saw it well worthwhile to go through that extra step to make sure that our kids were welcome and felt a part of the system. And so what, who, who is all a part of this? As I said earlier, this was, um, we made a presentation after our visit to Mexico, the other, other administrator and myself, got some other administrators on side and we pitched to senior admin this idea about what could it look like if we had a school in Mexico? Which if you now reflect on much of the history and the politics and the liturgy and the experience over the past hundred years uh, from Western Canada to areas of Latin America and back again is really quite significant in that narrative that now we have Canada leaving, uh, crossing the border to meet with this very community that left a hundred years ago to seek and to understand and also to seek to serve. And so we've sort of, they left Canada so we'll just follow them. Um, and we had uh, astounding success. Kids that would ordinarily show up in September and October did not want to engage be, or make friends or have any meaningful connections to their school experience um, because they were going to be leaving. And so why bother? Well, we want you to bother. We want to continue this relationship. So we went down and, uh, or Thames Valley did, agreed to take that risk, uh, the very calculated risk based on data. And again, um, these kids, according to teachers, are hardworking, intelligent, polite, uh, but data was telling us differently. It was telling us that they weren't literate, they weren't numerate, and they weren't graduating high school. So um, we went and set up a classroom uh, with MCC as our third party organization to help support this. Um, so I work with folks in, in Durango that are MCC workers, uh, the national overseers of MCC projects in Mexico City, Giovanni Marisol, and then Bonnie Clausen, who was originally from Kitchener, Ontario, who oversees MCC work, LACA, Latin America and the Caribbean. And we sat down and said, how can we make this happen? And so we did, and we, I think we had 25 students participate out of Thames Valley alone. And it was heartbreaking, but there were students from other districts coming into this area and coming into this building saying, can we do this? And regrettably, we had to say no because there's a lot of 
bureaucracy and legal things that we had to cover, but we will talk next year. And so we invited other partners to the table to say, this is what we're doing. This is uh, what we can offer your district. And so um, the MCC partnership soon involved the Ministry of Education of Ontario, certainly Thames Valley District School Board as the leader, uh, Lambton Kent District School Board, Grand Erie, Avon Maitland, Upper Grand, and the District School Board of Niagara. And for those of you that are familiar with the geography of Ontario, essentially anything along the north shore of Lake Erie is a part of Two Point Day now. So we get kids from all over the province involved there. And these kids really do see themselves living in two separate worlds, and that was also alluded to earlier, but we sort of brought that all together. In fact, when I went there the first time, I hadn't been there in 45 years, but I'd been involved in education in Ontario. I took a, just a walk down the street, which not many people do in Mexico, red zone. Um, and, and so I just counted, just again, uh, uh, my belief is that dreams are built on policy and decisions should be data driven. Even though at the heart of it, you wanna do what's right for kids. I counted license plates that went by me for 10 vehicles. Six of the 10 vehicles were from Ontario. So I knew that we, were, we had a field ripe for the harvest. How can we do this? And then one of those 10 had gone past me and, and I heard them. It's, they had the window down and said, hey, there's Mr. Wall. And I'm thinking, okay, this is, <laughs> <laughs> don't tell any stories. Um, or I hope I didn't ever suspend that student. Uh, so long and short of it, um, we, we grew a presence in that community because we founded our decision making on what's best for kids. We showed um, respect, we showed dignity, and we did not judge them based on whatever backpack they were carrying. We wanted to meet them in the middle and meet them where they were at. And if that happened to be in Durango, then that's where we wanted to be. And so the, the pictures that you've seen are all very real. Those are pictures I've taken. I go twice a year, once in November and once in February, to help, to assist, to monitor, to assess, and to reach out to community to build that rapport. So I meet with community leaders. I meet with teachers. I meet with whoever will meet with me. Mind you, uh, I'm astute enough to know that when in Rome, do as Romans do. So I take out my earrings, and I wear plaid. Uh, and. and <laughs> And then all of a sudden I'm in. I just speak each and, and then it works for me. Um, but it just in five short years, in focusing on doing what's right and changing the narrative that has written the history that we've heard about all day today, um, we now have bricks and mortar uh, in Mexico. So that building in the middle is our Tu Puente classroom. And we support students from across Ontario and even across Mexico. And you'll see the sign there. Hard to read, but the Twente sign it means uh, supporting Ontario schools and uh, supporting Ontario students and schools. So we see we are permanent presence. Thank you. Uh, they thank you. Um, we see ourselves as a permanent presence in the community now. Uh, we've made those connections. We've built that trust, and students are now expecting to just be served. And we've asked students, "How do you feel about this?" And so hopefully, I really hope this works. Oh, it didn't work. Back. Can we go back? It's always best to hear from kids, so I really hope this video works. There we go. Hi, and what's your name? Isaac. Where are we? Mexico. We're in Mexico. What did we just finish doing? Math. What else did we do? Reading. Mm-hmm. And some writing too, didn't we? Yeah. And you've got a big long list of words that you're learning how to read. Yeah. So tell me, what do you like about your school here in Mexico? I because I got to learn to read and learn to Thank you for letting me work with you today. Uh -huh. That was really fun. I know. How does that make you feel when you go back to Canada after you've been away from school? Not so fun. Not so fun. How come? Because I don't get to learn to read or math. When you come back to your teacher, Mrs. Hill, what do you think she'll say that you've been learning? I have no idea. <laughs> we'll have to ask her what she uh -huh. has to say. What do you want to say to the people who are helping to have a class here in Mexico. Thank you.
Is there anything else that you wanted to say? Yeah. What's that? I miss my teacher. Right? So out of the mouths of babes. So Isaac is our lunar lander, and he personifies all that we've invested in as educators and certainly learned from the history of the Mennonite movement, what happens when you make a concerted effort to change the narrative. So the families, when we talk to them about it, they are excited by it. The community is, is excited by it. But most importantly, the students are excited by it. They're engaged. They see their being a, a value to them being in the classroom. And they love being able to show off because we were fully technically supported in Mexico. So they'll take their iPad and show the classroom in Fort Burwell, Ontario. This is my class. These are my teachers. And so they remain connected. And really, the whole experience has been uh, a highlight in my career because, as I said earlier, that quote that was written 100 years ago could have been written by, by myself. And it could be written by some of these students. But any longer, it, that wouldn't be the case because those feelings no longer have to be real. Thank you. This one. Okay. But I go one back. That's it. So. Well, good afternoon. I'm being the last speaker of the day. I will try to keep this short and interesting at the same time. Um, I'm doing. Um, research, really a lot of field work in the old colony community of Salamanca, Quintana Roo, um, which is a very an orthodox community. Um, this is about schooling. I will give you the outline of this presentation. Um, among the old colony Mennonites, linguistic and educational autonomy are considered crucial conditions for the continuance of their lives. Um, based on field research in Salamanca, I want to illustrate how schooling and language use interact to protect the traditional separatist old colony way of life. Um, the old colony, uh, the old colony stands on educational autonomy in a way is a historical responsibility for the Salamanca settlers, as their background will show. Um, the education case of the Salamanca settlement gives field insight into the old colony's educational and linguistic organization and explains how schooling and language use codify their survival strategies. Uh, comparisons with current educational developments among Mennonite colonies in Chihuahua and some new developments in Salamanca will show that uh, Salamanca's uh, social, linguistic, and general status quo is not unchallenged. Um, well, that's Salamanca. Uh, well, I'll start with the very brief historical background, uh, most of which you have already heard. Really. The 19th century experience in Russia, the conflicts about education and Russian language as part of it, made schooling a pivot in the old colony privilege demands in their negotiations with Canada. The Mennonites were granted educational autonomy and the right to use German as the language of instruction in the schools, as we heard, as was explained. Uh, this um, the, this autonomy started to crumble, and with the School Attendance Act of 1916 and the enforcement of it in 1919, the old colony Mennonites were sufficiently triggered to move from Canada to Mexico in 1922. There, in Mexico, in Chihuahua, in 1958, innovations, proposals in agriculture, uh, Mexican government interference, and innovation proposed in education caused several groups of Mennonites to move from Mexico to Belize. 
De Salamanca, so my colony, the Salamanca Old Colony Mennonites in Mexico are descendants of Old Colony Mennonites who left Russia, left Canada, left Mexico, and settled in Belize. And then they, in 2004, they came back to Mexico. They have been raised with a schooling system that their forefathers repeatedly abandoned their homesteads for. They have historical reasons to consider their way of schooling necessary to live according to their religious calling. Um, the Salamanca Settlement. Uh, it was founded in 2003 in the south of Mexico by Mennonites from Little Belize in neighboring Belize. As said before, it is an orthodox agricultural old colony community. Access is gained by only one unpaved road from the outskirts of Bacalar about 12 kilometers long. Access, uh, no access um, to internet, radio, television, or telephones. All, about all agricultural machinery is allowed, though tractors are provided with steel tires. Horse and buggy are used for transport. The community has around 1,900 inhabitants in 17 Darpe, or the street villages. Um, the school organization. Each street village has a modest one-room school, like this, with about 15 to 30 pupils per school. Children between six, six and 11 years old attend school for uh, six months per year in three two-monthly periods. So, Girls and boys enter the school through separate entrance doors and are seated, girls on the right, boys on the left on the school benches, as we saw in the where we began slide. Just. Um, supervision of the curriculum and materials is the task of the Leadienst, the body of bishop and ministers in the community, the highest religious authority. It protects the Ordnung, the community's religious living regulations. The Leadienst regulates, among most other customs, language and education as integral parts of their church concept. Schooling is part of the children's initiation into the community's order. It is the bishop or the altiste who decides on the school materials to be employed and who will be the teacher. Teachers do not receive training. Mostly they are good members of the community and can show some diligence in reading and writing. It is not a meritorious job and the lack of teacher training stresses that school is not so much about knowledge but about learning to be part of the collective and humble discipline necessary to be a dependable member of the community. Um, then we go to the, the school routine. Um, the children are taught reading, writing, reciting, and arithmetic, all in high German. They start with the feeble, a primer guide to learn copying the alphabet in Gothic and Latin letters, then learning it by rote. Further texts are mostly about devout community behavior, Bible stories, pious verses, and songs. The main didactic resource is learning everything collectively by rote. The Fiebler level is followed by the Catechistler, the Testamentler, and Bibler levels. Their names referring to the core texts used out of books or from plasticized text cards. Arithmetic problems are also handed out on cards. And when they are a bit more complicated, they are written in Gothic print. Um, a, school deal, a school day usually consists of very much copying the Gothic writing and reciting the alphabet, the vowels, the consonants, and the multiplication tables. Singing is not mentioned as a subject, but is perhaps the most practiced activity. School tasks are done in obedient silence and are followed by collective, repetitive reciting and chanting. Singing is done at the start of the school day, before and after each break, and at the end of the day. Um, high German, now we go into the language use. High German is the school language and the language in church sessions, all based on the Lutheran Bible. 
High German in writing may be somewhat archaic in Bible text and in the self-made school material some errors may show, but the texts are mainly as readable as standard German. Um, in contrast, the Salamanca pronunciation of High German utterly differs from standard German. As such, it is the pronunciation authorized by the old colony bishops in many Orthodox communities. Jochtich, as I call it with a plodich word, is not meant for verbal communication, which excels its use as a ritual language. Social sciences, biology, physics are non-existent at school, as these areas would entail worldly knowledge, an unwelcome distraction in the old colony tradition. No Spanish is taught or spoken. Most women and children do not speak the language, and a number of the men speak basic to possible Spanish. The school subjects and school language policy strongly relate to the community's isolation strategies. Basic literacy, however, does fulfill a community role. Written notes about meetings, a shop's payment policy, or other information are glued to the store doors for, and, for, and for reading the shops. There are four shops in Salamanca. They sell the bi-monthly Mennonitische Post and the Deutsch Mexicanische Rundschau. Um, here you can see a few examples of those notifications that are glued to the, uh, to the doors. Um, the last one, the one to the, which is it, right? Um, that one is the first one I found completely in, written in Plodic. Uh, I found it in 2021, just one year ago. The other ones are older. Uh, no, I think the third one is also uh, from 2021. But this, this is the first time I found an attempt to write something in Plodic. And it's difficult to read. I uh, met Hans Werner in the Mennonite archives here. So I asked him whether he had the same problem as I had with reading it. Yes, he had the same problem. And, uh, but it could be quite a statement that we are seeing this in uh, Prodic. Um, okay. Um, now we go to the benefits for the community. Hedges, Sneath, Kaufmann, and other authors emphasize the downgrading of scholarly learning in old colony schools. And as Hedges explains, educational practices are all about maintaining the existing structure of the authority, the Ordnung. The children are taught humbleness. They do not get progress cards. Uh, competence is appreciated, but competitivity is not. Reading and writing are not about understanding the materials they work on. Arithmetic tasks are elementary because proficiency in high German is elementary. The level of literacy attained is never assessed. The children in Salamanca are taught collectivity before individual expressions. They learn to copy and not to question. They learn to be silent and not interpret or discuss. The old colony school quietly instills the community rules and protocols that regulate Mennonite adult life. In the schoolroom, the seating of each group is the way the community is seated in the church. They learn to sing edifying songs and the slow singing of the church services. The community's collectivity is visibly emphasized in the uniform clothing for small children, youngsters, and adults alike. The way the two-language system among old colony Mennonites is implemented serves the purpose of protecting the community's ways of religious living. Relating written language mostly to the sacred Bible text and other religious practices keeps it estranged, estranged from the everyday plodic, which is not written. The children learn to read and write a language they do not learn to speak in, and they speak a language they do not learn to read and write in. This peculiar deglossia at least suggests that the system limits communication outside the com community's borders again sustaining protective isolationism. When comparing, now we can see other communities, when comparing life in Salamanca with old colony life in Chihuahua, the colonies their grandparents left in 1958, 
One can wonder how long the isolationist protection strategies will hold. Nowadays in Chihuahua, there are at least four Mennonite primary to college institutions where German, Spanish, and English are taught. While German, Spanish, primary to secondary Comité Schule are gaining ground among old colony parents. The Mennonite privilege of autonomous education always has been a delicate matter in Mexico where the constitution prohibits education on religious ground. And so this is a very special privilege they have. In Chihuahua, the state uh, and the colonies have been collaborating to implement the Mexican public school standards. Orthodox old colony communities in the north are having trouble finding teachers for their village street schools. Besides, the interest in learning standard German with German teachers is notable. And simultaneously, Bibles in the Plaudich language are gaining popularity. Also, Spanish is much more common in, uh, among the Chihuahua Mennonites, but some young Mennonites told me they are more interested in learning English. In Salamanca, the Plaudich language in its written form is gaining interest. In 2017, only very few families possessed a Bible in Plaudich, but in 2021, they were for sale in the community shops. Moreover, all the preachers now have a Bible in Plaudich, although the bishop does not approve of this. A Liadienst member I interviewed in Salamanca stated that in the meetings of the Broderschaft, differences of opinion exist, but that the majority still agrees with the bishop. No change, we keep things as they are. Moreover, he considers the bishop always must be conservative to safeguard the Ordnung. As Kanyas Bottos puts it, in the eyes of the old colony Mennonites, religion is a total social fact, subsumed to the authority of the Liadienst. However, in 2021, a newly settled Mennonite missionary colony, Los Cuates, about 40 kilometers away from Salamanca, presents an important test case. There, a group of Mennonites performs weekly Bible readings and discussions in Plodich, inviting men and women alike to participate, something never heard of in Salamanca. I was told in 2021 that some young family men in Salamanca already were planning to move to Los Cuates. Um, so, going back to how schooling and language use protects the traditional old colony way of life and what it entails, we can see it is cl uh, clearly that in Salamanca, education methods, language use, and school organization are all about guiding the Mennonite children into the traditional community's religious way of life and adherence to the dominance of the Ordnung. The situation in Salamanca shows that upholding its school, school and language system not only is a heritage act, but the system stands as a buttress to preserve the continuity of their religion-based community. Nevertheless, given the developments in other similar communities and the force of modern globalization, it must be acknowledged that the status quo is not unchallenged. Thank you. All right. Thank you to the four of you for your papers. So we now have about um, 20 minutes for questions. So I'll open the floor and uh, hear from you. My name is Bernie Taves. Uh, I have a question for the last speaker. Uh, the old colony that forms Salamanca, I think close to the end of your talk, you mentioned that there was a group of Mennonites relatively close in a different village. I, I didn't catch the name, Los Cuatros. Los Cuatros. Uh, are th which area, are they from Belize? And if so, are they from Spanish Lookout? People in Los Cuates, they come. I went. I went to see them. They were very friendly. Uh, I could go to a Bible session with them. Um, they are from different parts. They come. Some from Belize. Some from Canada. From some from Chihuahua. They, they speak most well 
Half of them, they speak English and Spanish and German. I, actually, standard German. So, um, I, I think they are, the teacher is Kleine Gemeinde, is from Kleine Gemeinde. And, uh, but I don't know, I have not discovered yet where they are really from. Hi, Sam. Uh, so just following up on that question, uh, why is it that the Spanish, the, the Mexican government has been so involved with the school and education system in Chihuahua and Durango, but they've kind of seems to forgotten about what's going on the, in the Yucatan? Well, um, it's, it's not, I mean, the, the, I think the Mennonites in Chihuahua simply are more open to it, and the government sees its opportunity. They, they are already, in 1958, when this group went to Belize, that's when the first, uh, like, more uh, Spanish-speaking school started in, in Chihuahua, the Alvaro Obregón uh, school. So, um, it's officially, according to the Constitution, you cannot mix, uh, well, education has to be without religion. And already in the 30s, there was a big problem because the Chihuahua governor wanted to stop, uh, wanted to uh, implement Mexican education in, the, in Chihuahua, on, among the Mennonites. And they wrote a letter to our two um, Cardenas, the president, and uh, Cardenas went to see them, and uh, he was very impressed with what the Mennonites had already achieved on uh, the agricultural uh, level, and he told the governor, let them be. And, uh, but already in, uh, now I, this year, I mean, I was there in 2021, and I already received a photograph of people in Salamanca, suddenly, being recognized with a, with a um, Certificado de Primaria, which would be uh, an elementary school certificate. I don't know. I think this is a publicity stunt <laughs> of the local government. <laughs> but they do it. Something is moving. Uh, my question is for Roger, if he's available. Okay. Uh, Roger, my name is Blake Ham, and uh, my low German isn't very good because my great-grandparents didn't go down to Paraguay, so uh, sorry about that. Uh, but my question is about this, uh, this period between 1921, when Paraguay offers the Privilegium, and uh, November, December 1926, when the Sommerfelder do go down to Paraguay. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, the, the number of families who wanted to emigrate uh, dropped uh, substantially from 400 and some to, I think, 265. I uh, wondering if you had any more comments on that uh, as, as to why. I, I know nine, between 1921 and 1926, there's a lot going on. There's the, uh, there's the first migration to Mexico. There's the incoming of the Ruslander. I think Paraguay had a civil war. Uh, was it any of those factors that led to some, some Sommerfelder not emigrating? And was that possibly linked to their compromise coming too late? Was it was it a matter of too many too many Sommerfelder got cold feet, and the Canadian government sensed it and no longer needed to come to a compromise? Uh, yeah, just curious as to your thoughts. Well, yes, I I'm not able to to nail it down to one of those things. Maybe it's a combination of all of them. I would I would guess. Um, and then 19. 20, the, the economic situation in, 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 in Canada, as I understand, was tough, uh, especially for, for, for farmers. Uh, there was a drop also. Um, and yeah, maybe it was a combination of all of them, all, all of those. Although the, the, um, 
civil war or the, the unrest of Paraguay probably did not influence so much uh, in this drop of interest um, since Paraguay was politically very unstable between, uh, between 1904 and, and the 1930s. So, but, but maybe it was this, this, this compromise that some people were willing to make and, and, and you know, because of the living standards also, because, you know, um, owning a farm, uh, it's not that easy to leave it. Uh, I see it today still, I mean, Mennonite farmers love the land they live on and not necessarily the land they live in. Hi, yeah, my question is also for Roger. Um, I'm Stan Giesbrecht. Um, so I've got a question about, um, I'm from the Holdeman Mennonite background, and as far as I know, um, they didn't resist the German, uh, the, the, the switch to English. I think that was happening in the process uh, with John Holdeman already. I don't know, maybe you can speak more to that. I think my grandparents all went, to, they were born in the 20s, and I think they all went to school in English. But I don't know that much about it. Did you want to, do you have something more to say? And, and were there other Mennonites that didn't resist the switch to English? There were Mennonites that, that cooperated with the, with the uh, School Attendance Act of, uh, of 1916. Uh, when I went uh, through uh, archive records in, in downtown Winnipeg in the, in the archives of the province, um, I found numerous uh, um, letters and so on from, from, from Mennonite uh, construction builders that, that, that built those schools. And, and there were some villages, uh, especially in the West Reserve, as I understand, that, that were willing and uh, in, 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 in adapting those schools in their villages. And that was also encouraging for, for the Department of Education at the time to, to go on with the, uh, the project. Now, um, I do not know, though, uh, the situation in the Holdeman uh, society. Uh, however, um, the German language was almost sacred uh, to, to the, uh, to the um, Mennonite settlers of the Kartitsa church and so on. Uh, their German was not German per se, or, or a correct German, because they had never had any contact with Germany. It was more of a uh, local, local variety of a German language. But one anecdote maybe uh, uh, shows that uh, when the discussion came up in Paraguay in the shop whether to teach Spanish or not, uh, on, a, on a brooder shop, um, one of the members stood up uh, and said, we won't teach any Spanish in our schools since God uh, said in German, Adam, what is to? Adam, where are you? Right? So, so a place for Spanish. So German, uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was, their faith was believed in, 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 in German, I would say. Their God spoke German. I don't know if that answers your question at all, but that are some thoughts on, on, on the question. Hans Werner. Uh, this question maybe is for Roger as well, but, but maybe first for Conrad. I have a vague recollection that H.H. H. Avert was at a, one of these presentations of the petition. And I'm curious about who he would have represented and what would have been his position about the 1916 uh, Public Schools Attendance Act. Yeah, that's a good idea to have Conrad to help me out on this one. but. Uh... Uh, ben uh, Ubert was actually uh, at the meeting when they handed in the second uh, school petition, and he did write it uh, as, uh, as far as I have understood. And maybe Conrad can elaborate on that one. Well, they took him, I don't know what his position was on this matter, um, but when they did go along with Doug Benjamin Ebert, uh, then there was no one able to speak English anymore, which then again upset the government and, and, and helped them in their line of argument also. But yeah, Conrad, maybe you can. 
elaborate on that one. After World War I, Averidge changed his, his views on acculturation and education. Some of his sons signed up for the military and the MCI stopped being an uh, agent for acculturation and started being an agent for maintenance of Mennonite values. Uh, and so they started teaching German. And so there's a, a switch in Avers' viewpoint. Exactly how this school petition comes into play, I'm not totally sure, but I know that Avert wasn't, uh, wasn't consistent with his views over time. And I mean, few of us are. But, um, Uh, I have a question for Abe Wall. This is Aileen Friesen. Hi, Abe. Uh, could you expand a little bit more on maybe some of the techniques that you've been using in order to engage these students and um, sort of make the education culturally appropriate for them? I can certainly try. Um, so one of the routes that we've uh, really worked on as a strategy to get into the community is to meet regularly with the parents. And so um, we have soup and bun nights and those kinds of things. And we essentially allow an open mic or a community forum sort of process where we can hear firsthand why it is that they're so reluctant or afraid to send their children to public education or to public school. And oftentimes we find that it is indeed the case that all of their concerns, whether they're real or imagined or lived, or rumored uh, can be addressed fairly efficiently and effectively within education. And in Ontario currently, there is a strong push, and I'm sure it's not uh, alone to Ontario uh, for some culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy. So we ask the parents. So we seek parent input and student input. What do you want your learning to look like? And I'll use the example of some pilot projects. Uh, they're not even pilot projects anymore. So all of the districts that I work with in Ontario, all of them have now specialized, I'm mean, going to use the small S and specialized, but programming designed specifically to low German Mennonite learners for elementary and for secondary. And all of those programs are successful and have been designed with parent and student input. So um, a lot of our elementary, as you all might have imagined, in uh, hesitancy to become connected or too worldly, uh, the parents just, just teach them to read and write. So our focus in elementary, as an example, is on literacy and numeracy. And the vehicles whereby we do that oftentimes is uh, things that, um, that they see themselves reflected in. So we try to find books and material that have a Mennonite perspective and certainly use that also as an opportunity for them to learn about who they are. Um, a lot of the stories that were shared here today and certainly the ones that I myself uh, might have illustrated to some extent or another, a lot of our young people don't know their own story um, because of many reasons, uh, sociologically, um, economically, spiritually, faithfully, uh, they live very much in the present. And so once we have them, and it's not about having them in, in the competition sense, but once we're allowed to be at the table with them, we begin to teach them their own history and their own background and their own understanding of why it is, that it is the, the way they feel or why they feel the way they do about public education and understand that we're committed to removing systemic barriers and work towards the elimination of racism, which isn't easy, but it's, it's those kinds of opportunities for dialogue and exchange and us being responsive to parent and student concerns. And then most importantly, unlike has been their lived experience over 500 years, we move heaven and earth to make sure that we don't um, break our promises to them. Hope that helps. Hi, Sam again. Uh, also to uh, Mr. Walt, do you happen to have, uh, because it's such an interesting program, like a one education track, but going back and forth between two countries, did you either get any inspiration from other similar programs with other groups, or have you had anyone approach you to do similar uh, programs? Uh, I, I'm thinking, because I'm from California, maybe uh, more Mexican migrants, uh, Latino migrants from from uh, 
Tijuana going into Southern California or something like that? Uh, have, have you had anyone approach you or have you had drawn inspiration from anything? Was, um, no. <laughs> That's my answer. Uh, we haven't done this, Ontario hasn't done this with any other group. In fact, even in terms of the depth and breadth of the work that we're doing, uh, the ministry themselves have admitted that this six district partnership with a third party organization that's outside of, uh, it's, it's an NGO, um, is the biggest project that it's ever invested in uh, from an ideological perspective and certainly from a financial one as well. So uh, the model for it was really born out of a need uh, and there are very few, um, I'm going to say disenfranchised or, or marginalized people groups um, whereby this kind of model would apply itself in Ontario. The Mennonites are the transient ones and they go back and forth. The uh, parts of the Education Act that help support what we do, I think the original intent or design was to support students that left the country for things like parents in the military or they were professional athletes or competed on a world level. It's for those kinds of reasons that that part of the legislation was written but tucked away in there was the ability and the facility for us to be able to leverage the Ed Act and to come up with this um, program design because these students too left. It was just for completely different reasons, but it was there. So uh, there's no other people group in Ontario that has that migratory tendency. So we, um, we didn't have an example to lead on. And, and uh, certainly um, we've had conversations in the past about the decisions that we make when programming for low German minority students will also help drive uh, the decisions that we make for any group in our, in our buildings. And so it's not that we make these decisions in isolation. We do think about what are the law, what's the law of unintended consequences here and how will we be able to navigate that because historically these, um, their experience in public education has been marked with resistance and avoidance. Uh, and to bring those pieces to the table uh, invariably will cause, unfortunately, some people to think, why, you, why do they get special treatment when it's not really special treatment, it's just giving them the, what they deserve. Um, so there are no other people group that really fit this model as a need for delivery of public education. I do you want to follow up on that? You can go ahead. I've been asking a lot of questions. Um, we're almost out of time, so, but I think we have time for both of you. So. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Yeah, it's just... um, I guess my, my thought about that question is um, something that I was thinking about when in my research is that Mennonites, uh, or, and this group of Mennonites in particular, uh, migrate in family groups with their children, whereas other migrant groups tend to migrate as single individuals. Um, and so wouldn't actually have children who are migrating back and forth in the system to the extent that low German-speaking Mennonites would. I'm going to, I'm Tracy Hureska again. I am gonna ask a last question. I apologize because it's a big one. So I, it's for anybody uh, who has thoughts on this. Uh, where I was doing research in northern Mexico, in, in very far northern Mexico, the schools are exactly what Emma described to this day. So they, you know, they, they are taught in high German, which the kids, even by the time they're done, still largely don't understand and can't read. Uh, they learn Spanish, if they learn it at all, on the fly in outer society. Um, and it occurred to me that there is definitely a connection between the education system and the agricultural life way that those people live for two main reasons. One, the education they receive does not qualify them to do anything else. And two, it affords them an enormous amount of time for on-the-job training. It's very common where I was to see eight-year-old boys driving combines. They're learning how to farm at an extraordinarily skilled level at a very young age, something that the Mexican students do not have time for because they're in school all day, five days a week for a full school year. And so I'm curious for those of you who track education, have you witnessed historically periods where 
some of these more conservative schools were converted to a more, I would say, kind of modern school year and school system. And when that occurs, do you see more of a differentiation into other life ways? Because either people are pushed into it, they don't have the time to learn from their parents as much, or because they have the opportunity to do other things because now they have an education to do something else. Yes, I, I think I, well, at, at least what I noticed in Chihuahua, and um, in Chihuahua, many more people speak Spanish, many more Mennonites, but it's also, there was a necessity. I mean, perhaps uh, when, when the Mennonites in Chihuahua, I don't know, because the, the start of these uh, college schools, I mean, the... It was in the 19, it was the end of uh, the 50s, it was beginning of the 60s, and then it took a long time, but then there became other schools that also were interested. And, but it also has to do because there's not so much land anymore. So the Mennonites, the children, the, the, they have to do, they have to find other, other, other jobs. They have to learn Spanish, and they are in need of learning more and, and, and of, of, of having, I mean, when you're, when you're a farmer, it's much more important to know how to drive a tractor, tractor and to know about uh, the weeds and things like that. And that you can learn from your parents. But uh, when, when you have no land to prof, then you have to go into society and you have to know much more. And perhaps that's why in uh, Chihuahua, they are much more open now to uh, the, the official Mexican curriculum at the schools, or to even uh, English and uh, German speaking and Spanish speaking schools. So I think that, that must be a connection. Thank you, I think we need to wrap this up just um, because it's time. So thank you to all four speakers.